pleasure to be here between two very good close friends, uh, not only were we fellow students at the school and fellow sociologists, the last course I, the last class I took at the new school was a course that Andrew gave on Soviet institutions. Uh, he took me under his wings and to a certain extent of my mentor, so I want to recognize this publicly. If you read public reason and work, uh, social theory in civil society occupies a very important place uh, in the theoretical framework. So it was actually a project with working together on many, many things. And obviously, this is something that also organizes our interests in uh, the lecture tonight. Um, it is a very broad topic religious populism, populism, populism's right and left in Europe and the Americas. And it's going to be very superficial, partly because there is no theory of it, because I don't think that we can have a theory. The field is very complex, very fluid, and I'm not going to claim that I have a grasp of it. I'm going to try to see how complex it is, uh, to point out how uh, the field keeps constantly shifting. Uh, obviously, it's not only in Europe and the US that we are witnessing the emergence of populist movements, which are putting into question uh, uh, liberal democracy but also in other places. We could discuss Erdogan Turkey, we could discuss Modi India, we could discuss Duterte's the Philippines, we could discuss Philippines Russia, and some of these things will be also mentioned in uh, uh, the presentation. What, uh, in, in itself, none of these populisms are essentially or are mainly religious. Certainly in Western Europe, it's a very secular societies it will be very difficult to find or very very uh, unusual to find religious populists. And yet, all of them have some intriguing religious component. And it is this religious component how it shifts from place to place that interests me and is the thing I'm going to focus on today. Obviously, all of them are expressions of fundamental discontents and malcontents of a crisis uh, of, on the one hand, uh, political systems based on national democracies and global processes that no state can control and so the, the, the kind of uh, uh, two faces or the fact that states can really not anymore control uh, uh, processes either economic nor cultural nor media and uh, therefore uh, this which happens everywhere particularly obviously the European Union with the crisis of national sovereignty especially after the Euro, the, the Euro crisis became obvious so this is one issue the other of course is the fundamental also a problem of economic inequality, uh, even in societies that had, were accustomed to relative economic equality, like European societies, and uh, although not everywhere, because you can say that in Germany really, really uh, economic malcontent is part of the, of the alternative field of Deutschland, but, but the problem of the global inequality, and especially the crisis, I mean the radical transformation in labor, process in labor market, the role of labor, in, in the economies, and obviously this is a fundamental transformation of the skills. Uh, the fundamental problem today is that most the economies need, need less and less people to be exploited, and most of them therefore can be discarded. And this is really, really the problem for in many parts of the world. It's not anymore the problem of exploitation of labor, but the fact that the economy doesn't need labor anymore, or much less. Um, and uh, um, this is one issue. And then of course the problem of uh, uh, borders, uh, global migrations, refugees, and the crisis that uh, uh, it uh, uh, provoke everywhere. If to, the, if to this you add the global moral panic concerning Islam, Islam is a fundamentalist religion, Muslim immigrants, and Muslim jihadists, the three things being conflated, of course, Muslim, the jihadists are both Muslim and frequently immigrants, but most uh, Muslims are not immigrants, and most immigrants are not so, but they are conflated, and so uh, there is fundamentally the problem in with how we discuss those issues. So this is the very general context of this content within which these uh, populist movements emerge. But of course, and there are particular historical crises or events in different places that serve as catalysts, whether it is the London bombings. I remember I was in Sydney at the time with Tariq Modur, and he's at the end of multiculturalism. Uh, uh, England and the whole process of multiculturalism was never the same after that. Whether it is the, the, the riots in the in the Paris Barbier uh, right after, I mean the year after, whether it is uh, the crisis in Holland uh, with uh, uh, the assassination of, of Theo van Gogh. Uh, those are 
triggers of processes, but then you have the general European context. And it is fundamentally a crisis of the of Europeanism, of the European project. Uh, there is no European project anymore. Nobody knows what Europe should be. There is no idea of what Europe should be. There is no project. In the same way, there are very, very few political projects really countering seriously the, the populist discontent. And therefore, uh, the populists win because there is no economic project that are viable projects as, as electoral projects. Um, and the crisis basically has been building up. Uh, it began with first the institutional crisis of of the uh, constitution making, the European constitution. It was a terrible way the way it's done. Then you have the referendums in France and in, in Holland. And of course, it was lost because because the, 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 the very bad way in which they uh, uh, framed the constitution, the way they tried to sell it. But then the immediate response was, oh, you see, the people voted because they don't want Turkey in Europe, they don't want immigrants, they don't want more, it had nothing to do with it. But this was the way it was interpreted. So this was the beginning of a, of a process of, of the end of uh, uh, including other people. Uh, the relation with Turkey thereafter has radically changed. Obviously, you could say uh, uh, today is a self-fulfilling prophecy, of course, because we know what has happened in Turkey, but it could have been uh, different, different and different. And then comes the Euro, the Euro crisis, the financial crisis. And then we have, but then think, for two, three years, Islam disappeared as the other from the populist discourse in Europe. That had been five years before, populist discourse were anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, already. Then for three years, this discourse disappears, and the discourse is now the Nordic populist parties not, don't want to share their money with the pigs. Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain. And the old discourse of the hard-working Protestants, you know, basically, versus the lazy, profligate southerners. This was the discourse. The political, I mean, in Finland, in Denmark, the populist parties were basically a, a, a attacking the Greeks and the Spaniards and everything. So again, you have again the very clearly a crisis of solidarity. Nobody, and this is the way the alternative international you know, emerged from the party. We don't want to share our money with the others, ultimately. So this, the way in which it was handled also the crisis, to a certain extent, Germany was very much part of the, of the problem. And then, of course, did a terrible job in imposing a solution. And this basically created the very, very difficult conditions for any uh, European project. But again, those are uh, the context within which uh, you have the very fundamental price. We are discussing first European populism. So then you have the Brexit, the totally unexpected, right? Is there anything religious in Brexit? Probably not, unless you go deeper and you see then finally Theresa May enters a coalition with the Ulster Unionists to save the government. Now, the Ulster Unionists have been the most anti-European voice for a long time in the UK, because for them, the European Union is, was, and still is, a popist conspiracy of Catholic Europe. Uh, and this is the way they see it. And therefore, they don't want to have anything to do with it. There is some element, of course, of, of, of the UK that remain, uh, uh, um, that remain away from Europe. And this reminds us of the origins of the European Union. I'm, I'm saying this not to say the European Union, but saying that at the beginning of the European Union, there was some project of a, of a vision, Catholic, not necessarily of Roman Catholic, but of a transnational vision. And then there was a socialist vision, and both have disappeared. The European Union, the seeds were put when French Catholics basically contacted German Catholics already before the war ended to begin the process of reconciliation between France and Germany, which had been at war for 70 years. Let's not forget. And it was this beginning of dialogue between Catholics that had been the resistance and German Catholics that made possible the reconciliation between France and Germany. And also, the, recon the other reconciliation was between Catholics and Protestants in the Christian Democratic Party, post-war Christian Democratic Party. So it was a Christian Democratic Party. Uh, all the signers of the Treaty of Rome were Christian Democratic Parties, five of them in power, in Benelux, in, in Italy, and in, and in Germany. And the friends, the only friends that were for the European Union were the Christian Democrats. No Gaulish was for the European Union, no Socialist was for the European Union, no Socialist Party anywhere in Europe was for the European Union, no Protestant country anywhere in Europe was for the European Union, no Nordic Pro Protestant pa party, party uh, country, no the UK. Again, my point is, there was a vision of a transnational, the need to, to, to build a tra something transnational going beyond what was the nation state. And 
I'm saying this simply to point an element in the European Union that was is gone. Christian Democrats today do not represent this anymore. They are not in this respect Catholics anymore, in the same way as the other are not Catholic. Um, but there is element. The other anti EU are, of course, the opposite, are, let's say, in Poland and in Hungary. I mean, Hungary, obviously, uh, Andrew could say much more about it than I, than I, than I can. I don't know those cases very well, but this is so surprising, right? That uh, the way in which they talk of Brussels today as if it would be the new Soviet Union, that is imposing the kind of the same type of, of basically uh, reducing their sovereignty to the Soviet Union, the communists in Russia did. And uh, even in Poland, but especially in Hungary, uh, surprisingly, pro Russian, pro Putin, conservative nationalism against uh, liberal democracy, against liberal Europe. And it is this, this uh, possibility of a coalition between Hungarian populist nationalism and Russian populist nationalism. They say, what is going on? And then you realize that if you look at uh, what all these populist parties in Europe and groups have in common, all of them are financed by Russia Putin. All of them are somehow financed or sponsored. So there is the other element, we'll, we'll go into it in later, basically the transnational moral conservative basically organized by the Moscow Patriarchate to a certain extent, and that links uh, populist movements that have nothing to do with religion, but the element of the anti-liberal, anti-gay, anti-feminist uh, 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 defense of uh, uh, the old family, the old values, the old conservative system is there. But again, it's not core to all these movements, but it's there as an element. And the question is, at which moment this element appears? So this is concerning the anti eu populist nationalism. Allied to it is the element of anti-globalist nationalist populism. It is more the French. Le Pen, oh, this is an old, very old Gaulist nationalist, said that always felt uncomfortable in Europe, and with especially vis-a-vis -vis also EU imperialism and NATO. And this element of French populism is there in Le Pen. And, and very little religious there at the beginning is republicanism. They will say we are for Brigitte Bardot, not for, not for you know, and, and bikinis are the burkinis, and so on. So they want to be very secular and very laic. But laic, of course, laic was directed against Catholicism and then, and laic, of course, is directed particularly against Islam. So the fusion of republican laicism is fundamentally a xenophobic the base for the xenophobic anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic, because once you get this road defending Christian Europe and, and basically a nativist Europe against the others, well, this is the Jewish question all over again. And, and basically, the two are very much related. So there is an element here uh, of, uh, 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 in the case of, of uh, uh, France, uh, there is a very hardcore, it's more, but a very hardcore, very conservative Catholic right wing in France, which is polarized precisely around issues of same sex marriage. Very, very hard. And uh, had it not been for Pope Francis, this group has been today throughout Europe. This group have been a core of Catholic groups, basically, and gender issues, uh, you, uh, uh, centering this as the core of, of their populism. It didn't happen. Uh, Fillon was there as, the, as their candidate. Uh, because Fion didn't, did, did, didn't succeed. I'm not sure how many of them voted in for Le Pen, how many voted for Macron, how many stayed home. But it is this element very pro Russian, very conservative Catholic, French, and gender issues. Anti liberal, anti feminist, anti, anti, anti gay. And this is a, a, a very strong element there. Um, uh, anti immigrant nativism, all of them have. But especially it's very strong in some specific cases where this is the court in Denmark in Holland. Let's look at Holland because Holland is a fascinating case, right? The, uh, the populist movement of Pim Fortuyn and then Gerd Wilders began as a gay right movement, liberal against Islam, right? It was a gay right uh, liberal movement. But then it mm, turned into an extremely xenophobic uh, theological uh, defense of Christian cultures against, against Islam. And so you have this transformation in Holland. And this is the interesting question for me is if you look at Holland, Holland was the society that had tolerated the other, the only European society 
It was the refuge of Sephardic Jews that were not welcome in any other place in Europe. It was the refuge of the English Puritans that were not welcome when they eventually came to the US. It was the refuge of French Libertines and, and the Radical uh, Enlightenment. Um, and they were not expected to become Dutch. You are there, we respect you, we tolerate you. You don't have to become Dutch. Uh, and then you had the three pillars. It was a biconfessional society, Catholic, Protestant, and secular. You had the three pillars. And this is the way until the 60s was organized, until that society became so secularized. Catholics became so secular, the Catholic pillar disappeared, the Protestant pillar almost disappeared, and everything became one single secular society. This was the moment that they began the experiments with the fourth pillar. But the fourth Muslim pillar could not work when the other three pillars disappeared. So what you have now is a very secular, very liberal, very tolerant society that cannot tolerate those who are not as tolerant as we are. And so it's this contradiction of, of, of that toleration that was before tolerated the other and didn't force the other to become like us. Now we are tolerant, but they have to become as tolerant as we are, and they have to become like us. So this is this this kind of, 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 of dynamic, uh, which can be viewed precisely in, in that society that otherwise is such a, a liberal, such an open, such a tolerant society. Uh, so there is an element. Uh, of course, this is the anti-immigrant nativism is most visible in, in the alternative, alternative of the uh, This is really what, what has made the, the, the movement, and especially uh, their hate for, for Merkel. They talk of Merkel the way Republicans the, the, the Tea Party used to talk of Obama. I mean, they, they are going after Merkel. They are going after Merkel. They hate Merkel for having opened the borders and having letting these one million immigrants, refugees in. And again, this is a very interesting, very interesting aspect of the of the, it has transformed obviously German politics. Uh, the only one twelve percent only compared with you know, France or or Austria or or Denmark. Still, the right wing is much smaller than most other European countries. But a taboo has been broken. Germany, precisely because of its past, uh, had precisely this kind of taboo not to use, let's say, xenophobic, anti uh, uh, kind of discourse. And now it's broken. And now, obviously, <coughs> Merkel wants to regain. Let's not forget that uh, we, we have read basically of the three million voters, one million are people who never went to vote. So the people who had to start voting were out of the system. It's like the new voters for Trump. One million were ex CDU, ex especially Bavarian, CSU, uh, uh, that basically and the age of migration, they broke with their party. And the other million, almost one million, 900,000 something, basically from the link and from SPD, particularly from Austria, Germany. And if you look at the structure of the movement itself, you could say also there's three legs. One leg is radically secular, as you could even say, atheists from East Germans. East Germans are the most radically secular atheist society. The majority of the population is still but the Aussies have become very much like the Wessies and everything else. And religion no change whatsoever. There's nobody, neither the Protestant church nor the Catholic church have been able to take over the Germany. Every other institution the West Germans have taken. Religion has no future, has no, has no, has not been able to do anything. Every other group sends missionaries to Germany, no success whatsoever. So in this respect, there is a core, very radically secularist. But now you have a, a radically secularist anti-religious, so they are anti-Muslim in their, in their <coughs> secularism. This, they, this is a combination, and we have to get into, into the radical secularism of Prussia, that then turns into the secularism of Weimar, that turns into the secularism of, obviously, of, of the Nazis, that then turns into the secularism of the communists. And once they accumulate, and ultimately, uh, they made a deal, we, we will remind you that you were fascist if, 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 and if you accept our our regime, and so there is a silence about what the, the, the whole structure of, of Germany was before. And this element is there, but this is one. The other you have, cultural Christians. This is what is new in Europe, cultural Christians. So they are Christians which are not religious at all, but they are Christians. And they want a Christian Europe, they don't want the others. This basically, if we talk of Christian populism, is not, there are really very few, the religious people, Religious Catholics and religious Protestants are the least anti-Muslim in Europe. The only ones that have really, really interreligious dialogue are the churches, they are welcome the refugees, the immigrants, they are really organized in this respect. So the anti-immigrant come from what could be called cultural Christianity, national Christianity, not from the, the, the people which are religious themselves. I'm generalizing obviously 
also nasty religious people. And they, they, they knew all, they are also very nasty. Uh, some uh, uh, people still that uh, are religious. So, uh, but there is this element. And the third actually is people who were part of Christians, who were part of the CDU, uh, uh, even engaged, and that have left the CDU or the CSU uh, precisely on this issue. So there is an element in which a party that had been in no religious component now has a religious component of, of Christian, uh, uh, so far anti-Muslim, uh, but um, the ones you begin on this road uh, is uh, 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 the Jewish question all over again. I'm saying that because, uh, again, uh, an anecdote. Uh, 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 Merkel had done everything else was extremely cautious, and you could say even never there to do anything against public opinion. And this issue, somehow, she demonstrated the courage, uh, a courage that uh, basically a lot of people have resented very much afterwards. And it just happened that uh, uh, when she received the Abraham Geiger Prize from the Jewish community in Berlin, in Germany, and the, the ceremony was at the Jewish Museum, she asked that I give the laudatio. And it was obviously, it was right after the terrorism in Paris, I sat down to write the lecture the very day the terrorism defense. You could not talk about the Muslim question on the post. So basically, you have to talk about the Jewish question and then uh, realize that basically they are very, very close. And, and the Jewish community in, in, in Germany does recognize how close the two things are. Once you go, and ultimately, is the structure of, uh, of European nations, uh, the confessional structure, to use regular use of video, that turns every nation in Europe into homogeneously Catholic, homogeneously Protestant, and then they buy confessionals in between with, with their own confessional pillars, confessional lenders, confessional cantons, and then you have secularization without any increase of religious pluralism. So you go from homogeneous Christians of one sort or another to homogeneous secular, and they have a lot of difficulties to accept uh, uh, religious pluralism of any, of any kind. If they are still religious, because they still think in terms of of national churches, and if they are secular, because they don't want. They thought that they got rid of the problem of religion, now these people come back and bring the problem over. So they, they, they have difficulties dealing with this issue, and it's reflected in an anti-Muslim uh, uh, populism, which has both the secularists, and then sometimes becomes an anti-religious populism, but directed to Muslims, or uh, also uh, can go into Christian, uh, anti-Muslim populism. But let me ask again, uh, 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 very briefly, that the most perhaps intriguing moment is this transnational, uh, again, uh, there was a reference, I think, in something in the newspapers yesterday, of how they have this convention in which, uh, in Moscow, where they invited all these populists and also all nationalist parties to, 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 to be organized. And it is this uh, attempt to somehow uh, create uh, alliances between right-wing xenophobic, anti-liberal populist movements, and very conservative anti-feminist, anti-gay, anti-cosmopolitan, uh, and uh, around precisely uh, 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 to... Uh, uh, and this is a discourse that uh, in Poland has, has played a role. You expect that this discourse coming from Russia would not be received in Poland, but it has been received in Poland. Okay. Um, I think that, uh, uh, let me ask, um, ultimately, I think it's a crisis of, of national democracies, because within the European Union, uh, was the, the financial crisis. To a certain extent, the end of the social democratic project, the social democratic parties, none of them, either in power or in the opposition, have been able to present any option to, to, to the crisis. And the crisis of key nations, to a certain extent, and then the way in which basically the crisis was simply uh, solved by imposition of German uh, fiscal uh, 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 control and constraints. And uh, uh, this has led, on the one hand, to a very, very uh, complex dynamics of national politics uh, uh, and transnational dynamics in Europe in a moment in which, uh, I mean, to think that today we can put the hopes of the European Union in Merkel solves the crisis. 
if Merkel is the solution or what can keep the European Union, we realize that we are in a very serious situation. There is no project of the European Union, right? Uh, um, and so um, this is partly, I would say, uh, what we are uh, facing. Okay. Um, let me move. But there's no trust, and, and we, we could only find a solution in looking for transnational democratic structures. Uh, uh, but uh, rather than going there, we are going back to try to go back to the ancient past, 17th century mercantilism in the case of, of uh, uh, economic policies of, of Trump, or in the sense of autarkic policies, the same thing sense. But again, it's, as I would argue, is simply a crisis of, uh, of uh, ideas. Uh, um, as you can say, of universalism. There was a time when Europe was convinced that this was the telos of history, so they knew where they were going. And there was a time when they present themselves as the model for the rest of the world. Once the European Union becomes a club of rich nations, they are not willing to share the rich with the poor, which is what became evident in the last decade. Then it's very hard to, to, to establish the project. The only hope is that uh, Trump itself may unite the Europeans. This is one, the only dynamic pro European is against Trump. So Trump, I mean, you, the European Union needs some kind of enemy, I guess, to unite. Maybe, maybe but my, my sense is, really, uh, there is no, I don't see any vision anywhere, and this is a serious problem. So the populism is a symptom of the absence of any also of alternative project. Now, um, let's move to the United States, you will know much better. I'm not going to talk about Trump, because <laughs> I think I, I shouldn't read the news anymore, but we are all obsessed. But I want to remind ourselves how old this thing is. There was a time in the, uh, I don't remember the year, I didn't, I didn't check my notes coming here, uh, 18, the elections 1850-something, in which the Know Nothing movement you know, almost got to the White House. So again, nobody expected Trump to do it, and nobody, uh, they know, it's, you know, they know nothing movement was a nativist, uh, 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 anti-immigrant, uh, but of course racist and anti-Mormon. Nativism began as a, as a movement in the 1820s and the 1830s as a um, basically Protestant, white, uh, 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 anti-Mormon, anti-Masonic, anti-Catholic. And it has transformed itself. But race and religion have always been the two keys to American nativism and how they are related. They are the two keys to American exceptionalism. You know, when anybody trying to compare the US from, from, from Sombart and trying to come up with why no socialism, why no, I mean, it's race and religion that was. And of course, today those race and religion have come to Europe, and now you have some dynamics that were never part of European politics. Now, because you have, for the first time, race and religion entering European politics, then some of the same dynamics are beginning to develop. But this is, uh, American nativism is wasp. Wasp, it's all wasp. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. White against blacks, Anglos against Latinos, even in Texas they still call themselves, they are the Anglos, they are some of the Hispanics, and Protestants against Catholics. This is the best, and it has changed, of course. It has changed in terms of who is the other. But those are the dynamics. And we simply have to, 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 to recognize those are the dynamics. And to this were added, of course, and this is what uh, 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 Jean reminded me, rightly, from the culture wars of the 60s, the gender revolution, the issue of gender. This is the way the Christian right came back to the 60s, fundamentally around the issue of gender. And this remains the crucial issue. But when you hear, I mean, the, the, the new senator from Alabama, or the Republican candidate, the, the, the one who won the primaries, look, uh, it's back to uh, uh, race and religion. Only now it's anti Islam, right? So he wants to prohibit any Muslim to have a right to run for office in the United States. Or, you know, you cannot let a communist, in the same way a communist cannot be, you cannot let a Muslim. So the idea, again, you have the notion of fundamentally uh, um, uh, anti-Muslim. This is what is new. This is what is new, and 
uh, let's think of Huntington. You know, you all knew Huntington as the class of civilizations. And here, of course, Islam is the threat to the West, but not to the United States. When he was in his nativist mood and wrote his nativist manifesto, Who Are We? Uh, the masses don't even appear in the book. The Latinos are the other, the threat to America. So he never put them together. He wrote the class of civilizations, Islam. He wrote, Who Are We? against the Latinos. Trump has put them. Trump is the first that has put the Latinos in Islam. And this is what is new. And of course, the element to add to that is the continuation of the cultural wars and the Republican. The cult but this is, less, this is less relevant. It was much more relevant against Obama. And when the Catholic Church still was moral confessionalism, gender issues, and therefore the same sex marriage. But once uh, the second time Obama got elected, uh, the Republican Party said, I'm not interested in same sex marriage anymore. It's a, it's, a, it's a lost issue. And the Catholic Church was left with a problem. Thanks to Pope Francis, they also have, have abandoned the issue. But so it is this. A new fusion of all dynamics of race and religion that now have been linked to jihadism, uh, 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 Muslim migration, refugees. And we know how irrational the whole thing is, but uh, uh, those are uh, the elements of American populist definition. The walls, uh, basically, uh, 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 and uh, uh, people are basically classified categories. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Ari Solberg, one wrote a very interesting uh, essay, Why Islam is like the Spanish. Like Spanish. Spanish. Because uh, uh, Islam is the problem in Europe. At the time he wrote Islam was not yet a problem in the United States, but the Spanish was. Uh, Europe has no problem with multilingualism. You know, people <coughs> speak different languages in many countries. Nobody's going to pass an amendment to make uh, one national language, the official established language. Uh, so you don't have established languages in Europe, but you have established religions. And you cannot have religious currency. In America, it's the other way around. You cannot have established religions, but you can have established language. So you have a lot of amendments passed making English the established language of all kinds of states in the United States. The point is, this was the, the argument. The argument. But today, of course, those, why Islam is like Spanish? Now we see that both have come together. Let's say in the, in, in the United States, in universe. I'm now uh, 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 going to. Obviously, we can discuss many of those things in detail and, and, and in the in the conversation. Um, let me move now to the to the left. We've talked of the populist right. Let's look at the populist left. It's very little of it, but there is still some remnants of it, and I'm going to tell you where it got together. Um, you remember that Bernie Sanders visited the, the, the Vatican in the midst of the campaign, was invited to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences to give a talk in the midst of a conference on uh, uh, 25 years or 25th anniversary of Centesimus Annus. Centesimus Annus was the encyclical of Pope Boitila, or Jean Pope, Saint Jean Paul II. Um, um, 100 years after Renu Novarum, 91. 1991, 100 years after Renu Novarum, 1891. And was the first attempt to see what, how the Catholic social teaching can respond to the new globalized world after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and basically which kind of world of capitalism are we in the moon. And the, the Pontifical Academy of Social Science was a project of, of, uh, um, of Boitila also, and was a very conservative project. The president of the Pontifical Academy is a well-known sociologist, a woman, a Hegelian sociologist, Margaret Archer, but uh, who heads in somewhere in England a center on social ontology. You tell me what social ontology is. Well, it's basically to tell you the gender ideology, the notion that gender is constructed as an ideology. This was the core of, of Catholic moral confessionalism. Gender is ideology. And sex is ontological, gender is uh, ideological. And uh, so this was the core. But then, under, under Pope Francis, uh, you had the members of the Pontifical Academy, still the old ontological people, nothing changes, you have eternal truths, and so on. And then you have invitation, there was Jeffrey Sachs, who 
who was the only one that had been in the, in the original Centesimus Annus, and you know, call it from here, and environmental issues, global issues. Then you have two of the populist presidents from Latin America, Evo Morales from Bolivia, and uh, uh, um, Correa from Ecuador. I myself give a lot, give a, a, a keynote on, on, on cultural aspects of global dynamics. And uh, then Bernie Sanders was involved. Again, what I'm saying, I'm using this because this is the kind of coalitions that Pope Francis has tried to bring. Yeah. And uh, uh, more interesting than the populist, the state populists, that particularly Correa represents. Evo Morales less, because in the case of Evo Morales, it's truly a population from below, indigenous, this is the majority population of Bolivia. And, and in the case of Correa, it's very difficult. It's really, really the old traditional form of populism, ideological, and, and, and the way he comported himself there, only only group. That, uh, uh, the kind of, of, of president is. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, just go online and read the speeches that Pope Francis gave in La Paz to the popular movements. He has organized popular movements. Uh, they had a meeting in La Paz about four or five years ago and then a meeting in Rome, in Biden. Now, what is interesting about these popular movements? Those are the popular movements of what he calls the discard. Those people that the system descends. And the, lead, the, the slogan of the movement is the three T's. Techo, tierra, trabajo. The right to home, roof, the right to land, and the right to work. And the interesting thing about this, they call popular, not populist, and their aim is not to enter politics, but to develop transnational voices, self-organized as movements of civil society. They don't aspire to power. Again, those of us who have they have been there before, solidarity, we know all these stories of how much also the transition to democracy in Latin America, there were movements of civil society, they were not interested in becoming political society or state. But this is the interest, here is transnational. That's why uh, this is an interesting uh, movement which is sponsored by, by Pope Francis. And the other is uh, the pan uh, indigenous, pan Amazonian indigenous movement. Uh, the indigenous movements in Ecuador, in Bolivia, in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Brazil, in uh, Paraguay, uh, all of them realize they are fighting with their own nations. And that uh, you have indigenous populism, which is used sometimes by nationalist populists, but when really the, the need to for national development, the first things to go are the indigenous people, and of course the Amazons and all their, their environment. So we have the attempt now to create a trans, a pan, a pan a, a Amazonian movement of indigenous, precisely, to organize them as not directly to their own nation state, but as a global movement. So again, my point is that if there is any future in leftist populist movement, it will have to come as this type of transnational movements of civil society that are able to give some kind of political projects that are an answer to what otherwise is the globalization of indifference. When the Pope Francis says globalization of fraternity versus globalization of indifference. Again, there is, those are only signs of it. And they are very weak, obviously, and uh, uh, there are still. But my point is, if the Catholic Church in Europe had remained itself national Catholic churches, you would have a lot much, much more Catholic populism. But they've abandoned national Catholicism almost everywhere. Almost everywhere. You still have a lot of Catholics who are nationalists, but you have less and less people, the leadership of the churches, those involved in pastoral. They are really working today, the only people working for kingdoms and refugees in Europe. So these are the churches. Again, I was at a conference. Again, they welcomed Merkel very well, uh, very good, because at the time when, when she was being rejected by everybody, the Catholic bishops were the only one really supporting her. There was a conference of Catholic bishops from Germany, from France, and from Switzerland together to discuss immigration refugees. <coughs> At a time when national countries, national states, national groups could not come together to discuss this. They would never think that this is something that we should as because they all view it as a national problem, a national question. Uh, and so it's only in some form of international, right? The socialist international is dead. 
uh, the Catholic International is very weak, or if this is strong, but uh, my point is that the only response to uh, uh, populists of the right uh, can be populists of the left, which are basically uh, transnationally organized. And uh, this is something that... Uh, uh, let me finish with a few words about an intriguing country, my own country, Spain. Spain is interesting because the only country in Europe that has no anti-European populism and has no anti-immigrant populist movement, and has no anti-Muslim populist movement. When you think that, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, and of course Spain had, in terms of numbers of uh, uh, victims of Muslim terror, the bomb bomb, the Madrid bombings were more victims than any other uh, event there. But we as Spaniards didn't gang up together against Muslims because we were fighting against one, one another. We are not against Europe because we are against each other and we want to get out of Spain to join Europe separate. All of us. And so uh, our population, the real population today is Catalan nationalists. Now, now you see this is a real populism. It's a real populism. You see this half, they can mobilize half a million people. They ask you as them in Europe. You have half a million people on the streets all with flags. And again, it came out of the crisis, and not to want to share their wealth with the rest of Spain, and thinking that they will do better if they leave Spain and they join the European Union on their own. Of course, then you have to create all kinds of, of myths of victimization. And then they will, the crisis lately is led by the most radical part of the coalition, the coup. The coup, which is basically the combination of radical anarchism and radical uh, 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 assembly communism, anti-parliamentary communism. And for them, this is a process for the real revolution. They are convinced that they need independence. Not there. They don't care about capital. They want a real revolution. And so there is a very interesting aspect here. Um, but it's, it's curious why there is no, after all, you have an Al-Qaeda in Al-Andalus. They claim that all of Spain should become Muslim. And you will think that it would provoke a Spanish reaction against these Muslims claiming Spain for them as being uh, part of Al-Andalus part. No. And you will think, I mean, again, uh, the big European countries had been receiving immigrants roughly until the end of the 90s. Then they stopped. Basically, Germany, France, the UK closed their borders to immigrants. And in the first decade of the, of the 21st century, immigration came almost to a halt. And then Spain and Italy became the great receivers. Spain was receiving, in the first decade, one million immigrants every year. It's not that we have, and we came in one single decade to have almost this proportion of foreign born as, as, as the other uh, countries, but no anti immigrant. I mean, I come from a very uh, a provincial town, Saragossa. Half of the population now is 800,000. Half of them are people that were born in the villas, are village people. And they are confronted in their own neighborhoods a lot of new immigrants that they could never find. In West Africa, I mean, you know, where my mother used to live, the parties they would put every night. And somehow Spanish, I guess, are more tolerant of music and dances and so on. But there is something uh, I have no Spanish. 